Welcome to Speaking of Grace, the weekly message podcast from the Whole Life Church in Orlando, Florida. We're a multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multi-generational congregation committed to our mission of loving people into a lifelong friendship with God. We are committed to our vision of being a church without walls, fully engaged in serving the people of our community. Thank you for joining us as we continue Speaking of Grace. Goosebumps. Yeah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for my family. Thank you for your family. Lord, as I um, stand in front of this group of people, I pray that you'd put me really well out of sight and that you would step forward. I want to pray that you would say something that each person needs to hear today. And that might be different for each person. But Lord, I pray that you would speak it to them. I pray that you would open their ears if, you will, if they were willing to allow you to, to hear what you want to say. We pray these things in your name. Amen. What's the purpose of life? I thought I'd start with an easy question and work my way backwards. <laughs> no? Okay. All right. Well, if you were to walk down the road that this church is located on, you were walked far enough, you would run into a place called Rollins College. A few of you should be familiar with that. If you've lived in this area for any amount of time, you should have an idea of where Rollins College is. If you're not familiar with it, I'd say, you know, after church is over, just drive around. It's a beautiful campus, beautiful plot, spot. Um, and Rollins College has many things to be proud of, one of which is the fact that Fred Rogers of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood is a graduate of Rollins College. He uh, majored in music there. And Rollins left a very uh, significant imprint on Fred Rogers' life. In fact, there is a quote over a door in one of the breezeways. If you can find it, go find it this afternoon or some other afternoon. This is what it looks like. Life is for service. And Mr. Rogers had a photograph of that plaque that he laminated and kept in his wallet his entire life. Life is for service. Why do I ask you what the purpose of life is? Because if you don't understand what the purpose of life is, you will wander. You will wander. You'll try this. You'll try that. You'll try to find happiness over here. You'll try to find joy there. But it will be elusive to you until you understand what your life's purpose is. Once you understand what the purpose of your life is, it will give direction to everything else. And if you believe that life is for service, it will change the way that you behave. It has to. So was Mr. Rogers at all biblical? I mean, we know he was a uh, ordained pastor. But was, was this some sort of biblical foundation? Absolutely. Let's take a look. Let's see what Jesus had to say. No greater authority than that, right? Jesus said, you know how the rulers of this world lorded over their people and officials flaunt their authority over, the, over those under them. But among you, it will be different. And by the way, when he said you, he was talking about you. He wasn't just talking to his disciples. Then he's talking to you right now. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be the first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Is it fair then to say that Jesus could have said the purpose of his life was to be of service? And if Jesus thought that his life was for service, shouldn't that impact us? 
shouldn't that give direction to what we think is important and what we think the purpose of life is? Within the, within the secular culture, within the movies that are out there, you can get a lot of different purposes of life. You get the purpose of life is to get ahead, to be wealthy, to have money. You can get that the purpose of life is to get even with the people that do you wrong. There's a lot of different purposes out there. Unless we pick too much on the secular world, I'm sure a few of you have heard within the Christian world that God wants you to be rich and he wants you to have everything that you want and he doesn't want you to ever be sick and I'm sure God doesn't ever want you to be sick. But I'm also sure that God doesn't think the purpose of your life is to never be sick, to never experience pain, to have stuff. I want to suggest to you that the purpose of life is service, and that service can look like a lot of different things. But as a Christian, if we're followers of Jesus and we believe what he says, the purpose of life is service. And if you believe that, it will influence the way you behave. We see that in this amazing movie that was the the subject of, of this week. We watched it here at the church on Tuesday night. Tom Hanks stars in A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. I kind of almost find this amusing because you see that poster that says, Tom Hanks, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. But if you've watched the movie, you, you know that he's not the main, the main person in the movie. The main protagonist in the movie is another person named Lloyd Vogel. In fact... Tom Hanks was not nominated for any leading actor awards for this movie. He was was nominated for a number of supporting actor awards for this movie. And I have to think that as he portrayed Fred Rogers, if Fred Rogers were still alive today, he would be thrilled, thrilled that he wasn't the main character that he was a supporting character. Because if you believe life is service, you quit taking the center stage and you see yourself as supporting other people. That's what it means to live a life of service. You don't see yourself as the main character and everybody needing to fill your life. You see yourself as the person that's there to fill the lives of others. You're supporting, not lead. After all, Jesus is the lead character, right? At least in the Christian life, right? I did get that right, right? When I, Jesus? Okay, just checking. A few of you are here with me. That's good. So in this movie, Tom Hanks stars, they said, Matthew Reese plays a guy named Lloyd Vogel, and uh, uh, Susan Kelechi Watson plays um, the wife of Lloyd Vogel in the movie. It's based on the true story of Mr. Rogers' friendship not with Lloyd Vogel, but a guy named Tom Junnad. They, t- they changed Tom's name to Lloyd in the movie because they wanted to go ahead and be able to say based on a true story. They don't, they don't want to have to be completely factual. Um, and so they changed uh, Tom Junnad to Lloyd Vogel. But uh, there, the real story is that Mr. Rogers had a friendship with this man right here, Tom Junnad. Tom was a writer for Esquire magazine, and he was asked to profile Mr. Rogers and what was supposed to be a short profile turned into the cover of a hero's edition of Esquire that came out, um, let's see here if I can remember, uh, November 1998, came out in November of 1998. And the title of the the, uh, article was, Can You Say Hero? If you've not read it, it's lengthy and it's worth your time. It's worth your time. Fabulous writing. Um, Tom is an incredible writer. Um, And in the movie, 
they make Lloyd Vogel an incredible writer, writing for, for uh, Esquire magazine and doing the same thing that Tom, Tom did. Now, in the movie, the character Lloyd Vogel is a very jaded human being. He grew up with a, in, in a family where he watched his mother die at a young age, and his father, instead of being there to support his mother, ran off with his mistress, leaving Lloyd and his sister to watch their mother die and then bury her, pack the house, and get out, as Lloyd says in the movie. When he harbors deep anger and hostility toward his father for that. And it's an interesting thing that our past always influences our present. And so Lloyd doesn't want to ever be anything like his dad. He wants to live a life of service too. And so he pursues a very noble profession. Some of you can laugh, but I've been a journalist, so I think it is a noble profession (laughs) when done correctly. (laughs) And Lloyd sets out to to expose the truth. Because when you have somebody betray you, you stop trusting people. And Lloyd knows that, that people can't be exactly who they say. And people like Mr. Rogers, he can't be that good. And so the hilarious thing is his, his editor assigns him to do a fluff piece on, on Mr. Rogers, which he's completely incapable of doing. He's, he's wired to write exposés. And so he, he goes to do this story. And the thing about it is the only reason why he was assigned to Mr. They were doing a whole bunch of different hero pieces, different people that were heroes. Mr. Rogers was the only one that would agree to Lloyd Vogel interviewing him. Everybody else wanted nothing to do with this hard-hitting reporter that was going to expose them. And Mr. Rogers agrees that much to the chagrin of his producer, friend, and kind of PR handler, Bill Eisler. We are here because Fred wants you here. Honored. He likes everybody, but he loves people like you. People like me. I've read your work. You don't really care for humanity, do you? (laughs) I'm just doing my job. I insisted he read you before we agreed. Every article we could find. So Fred Rogers read every article they could find, and he still agreed to do the interview in spite of the overwhelming evidence that this guy was going to come after him like a a runaway train. Because in Bill Eisler's word, he likes everybody, but he really likes people like you. He loves people like you. And you see the kind of that, that look that Lloyd gives, like people like me. Well, later on, he kind of figures out what he thinks Bill is saying. Because there's a part where he's talking to Fred Rogers and he says, you love people like me. And, and Fred looks at him with puzzlement and says, people like you, Lloyd? He said, yeah, broken people. But here's the thing that Fred makes clear to Lloyd when he says that he didn't view Lloyd as broken. He viewed him as worthwhile. He viewed him as a human being who was doing the best he could with what he had, and he wanted to walk alongside him and be there with him. Bill Eisler for sure viewed Lloyd as a broken person, but Fred Rogers did not. You know, at this church, one of our values is acceptance. We talk a lot about it. And this was a big word to Fred Rogers. Fred would repeatedly say that he did not believe that any human being could ever change until they were fully accepted as they are. Not as who they may become, 
Not as who we hope that they'll become. Not as who we hope if we manipulate them enough that they'll become that. Not if we put the truth bomb on them that they'll... No. That they, we love people and accept them as is. Without an asterisk on it. And in this movie, you see that's exactly what Fred Rogers does with Lloyd Vogel. He accepts him as is and walks with him. Fred was living out the principle that's found in Romans 12, verses 9 through 10. Don't pretend to love others. I want you to hear that. Don't pretend to love others. Don't pretend to love others. If you don't remember what it means to love in the biblical sense, I did a series on that. You can go back and find it. It won't take up a lot of time. 1 Corinthians 13, though, is where you can begin. Don't pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Did you say it didn't say hate those who are wrong? Say it, hate what is wrong. A lot of Christians get really confused on this verse. We say that we're, we're hating the sin. Hate the sin, love the sinner. But a lot of times it looks like hate the sinner and hate the sin. That's not what Christ has called us to. He's called us to something more. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ accepted you before you obtained perfection? (laughs) A couple of you caught that. A couple of you are sinners in here. And as Paul would say, I'm the chief of sinners. And yet Christ accepts me where I am and I don't fear for my salvation and neither should you. This is not cheap grace because grace is never cheap. This is me telling you that there is no possible way for you to reach perfection on your own. You got to have Christ. And what that means is on that journey, he's with you in your imperfection, accepting where you are and being with you on that journey. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. One of the the scenes that just touched me in probably a different way than it touched any of the rest of you is Lloyd Vogel walks into the studio or Fred Rogers is filming, uh, you know, his, his show. And Fred is on camera. And these are the days when there's real film in those cameras. And Fred breaks out of what he's doing, goes, there's my friend Lloyd Vogel. He's a wonderful writer. Boy, that touched me. Don't we all long for, for people to see what, what we're good at? He didn't, I mean, Mr. Roger could have said, watch out, Lloyd Vogel's in the house. Be careful what you say, guys. Lloyd's here, and that would have been true. That would have been very true. But instead of looking at what was wrong, Mr. Rogers looked at what was right. There's Lloyd Vogel. He's a wonderful writer. Is that how we treat people? Do we see the beauty in them or do we focus on what's wrong with them? Never pay back evil with more evil. Can I just say something about this for a second? In our movie watching, one of the messages that is sent a lot to us is to repay evil with evil, right? The hero gets put down, and then they get even, or better yet, they get ahead. It's a dangerous message for a Christian to be putting into their mind. Because what it does is it gives me permission to get even with you when you do bad to me. It says that justice means that I need to put you in your place, or at least someone needs to. But that's not how God's kingdom rolls. I seem to recall a man named Jesus who had all the power in the universe and yet still 
was nailed to a cross, who said, Father, forgive them. It wasn't just talking to the Roman soldiers nailing him to the cross, but was speaking to you. Christianity tells us that we don't repay evil for evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing more evil. Oh, I read that wrong. I'm sorry. That was the Hollywood version of that. My bad. Let's go back to the Bible version of that. But conquer evil by doing good. Unless you think I pick on Hollywood, can we just be honest? We're that way in Christianity too. There's been a lot of Christianity that's tried to conquer evil with evil. You think about the Crusades. Think about the way that we have treated minorities. We can think about the way that we have gone about sharing the gospel. So it's easy to pick on an entity over here. It's a lot harder to look into my heart and be honest about the way I go about conquering evil. And I know the thought is out there. You're thinking, well, man, it must be nice to be a saint. I mean, if I were born like Mr. Rogers with a natural innate sense of doing good, then I'd be good too. Fred's wife had something to say about that. So, how does it feel to be married to a living saint? Yeah, I'm not fond of that term. If you think of him as a saint, then his way of being is unattainable. You know, he works at it all the time. It's a practice. It's a uh... Practiced. And if you were watching the clip earlier, you saw Fred admit he snapped at one of his grandkids, which I don't know about you, but that makes me feel a lot better about my parenting right now. Because <laughs> uh, if, you know, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just being honest with you. And if it makes you feel any better, I snap at my kids. And I'm not proud of it. And I have to ask for forgiveness. Mr. Rogers is fawning of telling adults and children that it's important to identify our feelings. I was watching an interview with Brene Brown recently where she said she did research and that most adults can only name three feelings. When they're asked how they feel, there's only three feelings they can name. Mad, sad, or happy. But isn't our experience a lot, our human experience a lot more complex than that? Those three words do not begin to adequately describe what we're going through. Until we develop a vocabulary that can't, can't exp explain what we're feeling, we have a hard time dealing with what we're feeling. And so Mr. Rogers is fond of telling people to, be a, to, to express their feelings, to, to examine them, to think about it. But what he also told them is that it is important for us to find ways to deal with those feelings that don't hurt others in the process of dealing with that pain. Mr. Rogers told Lloyd Vogel in the, in the movie that every human will inevitably experience pain and suffering. And if you're sitting here today, you know that's true. It's inevitable. We're all going to hurt. We're all going to be hurt. What becomes telling is how we deal with that pain and that hurt. Joanne tells Vogel that Mr. Rogers dealt with the pain and hurt in his life by exercising praying by, for people by name. And there's a beautiful scene in the movie that I, I want to mention really quickly where Lloyd, where Mr. Rogers whispers into the ear of Lloyd's father who's, who's dying of cancer. And outside the house, Lloyd asks Mr. Rogers, what did you say to him? And Mr. Rogers said, I asked him to pray for me because somebody who is suffering that much must be very close to God. What's that, what that's based off of is, if you read the original article, it's based off the fact that there was um, a, a young child that was going through a, a, an incredible suffering. Um, they had incredible suffering on them. That child was lashing out at all kinds of different things. 
And Mr. Rogers, when he met with that child, at one point whispers into the child's ear exactly what he whispered into the ear of Lloyd's dad. Please pray for me. And it changed that child. That child thought, if Mr. Rogers needs me to pray for him, it gives me purpose and sense. And it it helped that child deal with his pain. And Tom Junnett congratulated Mr. Rogers for his excellent psychology and helping that child find peace and happiness. And Mr. Rogers looked at him with the puzzled look and said, oh no, I wasn't, I genuinely wanted him to pray for me because I need prayer. You know, sometimes living a life of service means accepting others people's service to you. And sometimes that can be the hardest thing. We're happy to serve other people, but we're not so happy at receiving. But somehow Mr. Rogers found a way to receive and to ask for what he needed. Let's not be confused that a life of service is somehow a life where you don't ever get anything that you need. A life of service means being willing to say, I need this. Would you please help me? And sometimes the greatest gift we can give another person is the ability to serve us. Now, there's some who take that a little far. But I don't usually find that to be the case. We need to be able to be of service and to receive service. So I'm humbled as I finished up that movie. I'm humbled because all throughout the movie, we're never told what Mr. Rogers' pain is. It's pretty obvious that there's some pain and suffering in his life, and Lloyd Vogel tries to get to the bottom of it, and he never gets an answer. In fact, One of my favorite scenes is, he said, you must have some story, Barry. How do you deal with that? And Mr. Rogers had just gotten done saying that there's all kinds of different things. And one of the ways is like pounding the notes on the the bass end of the piano. And so Lloyd says, well, how do you deal with it? And and he gets and goes, bum, bum, bum. And at the end of the movie, it's tempting to think, oh, everything's beautiful because Lloyd gets his life all figured out. He's on track. But I love how the movie ends. I love how the movie ends. about you? Will you find ways to process through your pain and your hurt that don't hurt other people? Maybe just a Steinway piano? I think the beautiful thing about this movie is what it points out is that Mr. Rogers had pain in his life. It never tells you what that pain was because for Mr. Rogers, the pain and suffering in his life were something that he dealt with in the way that he could, and then he put that over the side and did not make it the focus of his life. He found the way to release that pain and that hurt in ways that didn't hurt others and instead built up the community that he lived in. I'd like to go ahead and let Mr. Rogers finish this sermon and this sermon series. Fame is a four-letter word. And like tape or Zoom or face or pain or life or love, what ultimately matters is what we do with it. I feel that those of us in television are chosen to be servants. 
It doesn't matter what our particular job. We are chosen to help meet the deeper needs of those who watch and listen day and night. The conductor of the orchestra at the Hollywood Bowl grew up in a family that had little interest in music, but he often tells people he found his early inspiration from the fine musicians on television. Last month, a 13-year-old boy abducted an eight-year-old girl. And when people ask him why, he said he learned about it on TV. Something different to try, he said. Life's cheap. What does it matter? Well, life isn't cheap. It's the greatest mystery of any millennium. And television needs to do all it can to broadcast that to show and tell what the good in life is all about. But how do we make goodness attractive? By doing whatever we can to bring courage to those whose lives move near our own. By treating our neighbor at least as well as we treat ourselves. And allowing that to inform everything that we produce. Who in your life has been such a servant to you? Who has helped you love the good that grows within you? Let's just take 10 seconds to think of some of those people who have loved us and wanted what was best for us in life. Those who have encouraged us to become who we are tonight. Just 10 seconds of silence. I'll watch the time. No matter where they are, either here or in heaven, Imagine how pleased those people must be to know that you thought of them right now. We all have only one life to live on earth. And through television, we have the choice of encouraging others to demean this life or to cherish it in creative, imaginative ways. All right. Well, if you want to join in the conversation, you can just scan the QR code on the screen, or if you're online, just join us via the chat features. A lot of threads you could pull on from that movie, right? <laughs> yeah, I think I could have done about 10 or 15 different sermons <laughs> than the one I did. It was hard. I, yeah. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of good stuff and some good questions coming in. We're a little short on time, but let me just jump right to them. So Jaime asks, how do you balance the efficacy and sensitivity of loving and honoring without being annoying? <laughs> well, I think that Mr. Rogers was uh, definitely on occasion uh, tagged with annoying, right? Um, and I guess I would rather be annoying that way than unannoying a different way. Um, I would like to be annoying by being too kind than them being mean um, and unkind. So I, I don't know. And I, Jaime, that's such a good question. I don't know. I think that I would spend, le for me, I think I spend less time worried about being annoying and just more time worrying about whether I'm being kind and loving. Yeah. It was a powerful point in the movie when uh, Lloyd said, I, essentially, I didn't, I didn't like the conversation I wanted it though. I realized yeah. I needed it. Yeah. And that deeper yeah. connection or, or dealing with yeah. those issues. Jen, Jem also asked a pretty weighty question. How can one be the supportive person, character, Christian in everyday life without becoming invisible even to yourself and then burning out? Yeah. I think it goes back to what I mentioned briefly is accepting service from others as well. I think what I notice a lot is when people burn out, it's because they don't believe that anybody else can be of service or that if they allow others to be of service, it takes away from what they're doing. 
Um, and so I think that one of the ways to not be invisible is to admit when you need help, to ask for help, and then to ask people and accept people's service to you when you're in need of it. And so I think that's one of the ways to keep from becoming invisible. Yeah. Thanks for the conversation. Thank Powerful you. today. Thank you. Mike, thank you. This has been fun. We'll have to do this again sometime. I think so. Yeah, we'll have to do that again. I love you all. I love you, family. Thanks for being family. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to be like you. We admire Mr. Rogers, but he's not who we aspire to be. Aspire to be. We want to be like Jesus. We know we fall short, and we thank you for loving us in spite of that. And that you bring about the trans- transformation in our lives at just the right time. Help us to accept your grace and pass that grace on to those around us. We pray in your name. Amen. All right, 5.30. Be back here for an amazing night of worship. We've got uh, just a phenomenal guest that's going to be here. And uh, Albert, we just uh, thank you for putting that together. So we look forward to doing that. And next week, uh, we're going to start a, a series called We Are Family. So come and find out what that's all about. Until then, you know I love you. Go love your world. Hi, this is Randy McGray, podcast producer and host here at Whole Life Church. Loving people into a lifelong friendship with God is our mission at the Whole Life Church, and our podcasts, Speaking of Grace, and its companion, 15 with Andy, Randy, and Jeff, are designed to help facilitate conversations that help us grow together in that pursuit. Now that you've heard the message for this week, don't forget to check out the Whole Life Takeaways for this message. Swipe up in today's show notes and join the conversation. Speaking of conversations, each Wednesday morning we take a closer look at the week's message. That's right, the one you just listened to. We discuss practical ways to apply spiritual lessons and ask honest questions about the issues we face as Christians. All focused through the lens of grace. Your voice is a welcomed addition to that conversation. We encourage your thoughts and your questions by sending a voicemail or text to 407-965-1607 or send an email to podcast at wholelife.church. You can find everything podcast related on our website, wholelife.church slash podcast. And plan on spending every Tuesday evening and Wednesday morning with us as we bring you the Whole Life Church inspiration you love straight into your headphones. Thanks for listening and have a great week.